Are you ready? Nigeria, Ili Ends Health Society, in partnership with Dental Technologies Consult Limited, presents exclusive ends on dental implant training. Gain real life knowledge for success in implantology. It involves online classes as well as in person workshops. Procure the equipment and supplies you need to run a profitable implant practice. Facilitator, Dr. Uvo Onorube. I've heard so much about implants, but this was, let me say this is a practice defining lecturer experience. Um, I would definitely recommend it to others to participate in the program next time. For inquiries, contact Ego on plus 234802-322-9290. For more info, visit www.8ends.org slash courses. <laughs> okay, good. So, well, uh, <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Um, one minute to try to get rid of this and put this the laser paint. Uh, my name is Xiao Song. I'm an oral surgeon from the University of Michigan. Uh, my clinical research focus um, is bone regeneration and dental velar uh, reconstruction. Um, I want to thank Dr. Honorio B for inviting me to be part of uh, this webinar series in the topic of surgical anatomy of implant placement. A professional knowledge of the oral anatomy um, is needed to provide effective implant placements. Today, we will review the basic anatomy structures that we routinely encounter during implant placements. Before that review, I would like to uh, refresh our understanding of a few implant concepts. These concepts allow us to decrease the risks of um, intraoperatory or postoperatory complications or future implant uh, failures. Dental implant is a surgical component that interfaces with the jawbone to support a dental prosthesis. Implants need to be also integrated to be considered as successful. Also integration is defined as the formation of um, the direct interface between an implant and bone without intervening soft tissue. Also integration of the primary of the implant relies on the primary stability initially, with an increase in the role of the secondary stability over time, which is here. Dental, uh, so these stabilities can be measured with a non-invasive uh, resonance frequency device and that measures the implant stability quotient. Uh, I think usually in the market, we have like a two type, like off sale or penguin. And this one, what we do is uh, we place the implant and then uh, we add these packs, we connect the packs to the implant and we use this device to measure the stability. Usually when we have a score above 70, we consider the implant stable. And we do this uh, in the first, uh, to measure the primary stability at the moment when we place the implant, and we measure around four months after to measure the secondary stability of the implant to determine if the implant uh, is ready for the restoration or not. So this, you can see this score goes from one to 100, and usually, um, you get like a 70 something or to 80 something uh, when you have a, a stable implant. So in order to reach a good OS integration, we need to perform a thorough clinical and radiographic examination. CBCT imaging is ideal for uh, the pre-assessment, not only for the bone quantity quality, but also for the position uh, to determine the position of the adjacent teeth or the anatomical structure uh, surrounding that surrounds the implant, the future implant. So we have other radiographic images that are not very accurate and it's very common used uh, in many uh, dental practice, right? Which is the panoramic radiograph. As you can see in this image, you can have a magnification of uh, between 15 to 30% that varies from site. Right, so it's not accurate uh, if you're going to place implant because in each side there's a, some type of distortion. For some reason, this is uh, a little slow. I'm sorry, the, the passing of slide is a little slower. <laughs> so the OSA integration success is related to the bone quality. 
and quantity. Uh, Dr. Lecon classified the bone in four types. We have the type one, which is a very dense bone with almost entirely homogeneous compact bone that provides very good anchorage when you have a, a very thick cortical bone. But the problem comes is you have a very tiny uh, tubercular bone giving very low vascularity for the pre-implant osseous integration. Then we have a type two, which is considered as the ideal bone for the implant. When you have a thick cortical bone, right, that, that's going to give a very good cortical anchorage for the primary stability of your implant. But at the same time, you have a, a enough amount uh, of the trabecular bone that's going to give the vascularity necessary for the osseointegration uh, process, right, during the healing. Then we have a type three and type four, which are considered soft bone. With a uh, type three, um, with a little more uh, favorable strength of the cortical of the trabecular bone uh, in comparison to the type four, which have a very low density bone, uh, not only the cortical, very thin layer of cortical bone, but also the cancel of the trabecular bone uh, is very porous. So this is a not very good uh, bone for an implant. So the other component that is important and critical for the OS integration is the bone quantity. So in order to increase the success rate of the implant, we have to make sure that the implant has to be surrounded by uh, the bone, right? At least 1.5 to 2 millimeter of bone in all wall of the implant. We have to make sure that we have at least one to two millimeter, ideally two millimeter of bone between the maxillary sinus and the implant or between the implant and uh, some type of nerve canal as a, um, uh, the AN, which is the inferior alveolar nerve canal. I know it's um, the slide passing, yes. <laughs> the other thing that we have to make sure that we have enough space, when we plan an implant, we have to make sure that that implant needs to have at least two millimeter uh, of space uh, re related to the adjacent tube. That is to avoid uh, future horizontal resorption. And we are placing two implants. We have to make sure that these two implants have to be, have to have also a uh, certain distance, which is a recommended uh, distance three millimeter and the same with the same concept, right? To avoid the horizontal resorption. So now that we have refreshed a few of these uh, basic concepts of implant placement, uh, then we're going to review the anatomic structures related to the dental implant, where we're going to see that this concept, basic concept is very important because uh, we will have to apply it in these anatomical uh, structures, right? So planning and review of anatomy before surgical procedures can help to avoid problems. Again, the CBCT should be considered uh, because it is an important diagnostic aid in predetermining the presence of unexpected findings that we can we can see in the clinical assessment or in the convention or radiographs. So in the maxilla today, we will review the uh, only the maxillary sinus and the nasopalatine incisive foramen, and uh, in the mandible, we will review the mandibular arch morphology, the inferior alveolar canal, and the mental foramen. So the maxillary sinus um, is one of the four paranasal sinuses and it's located near the nose. Basically is we have a two sinus in each side of the nose. So the maxillary sinus is one of the anatomic structures that affect the implant placement, especially in the atrophic ridge when the sinus becomes very atrophic. So the maxillary sinus uh, usually expand when we age and it gets in, uh, and becomes enlarged when the posterior teeth are extracted. When we don't have a posterior teeth, then we can see a very low implantation of the maxillary sinus. So one important part of this maxillary sinus is the ostium, as we can see here, which is the, an opening that forms the drainage channel of the maxillary sinus to the middle meatus of the nose. So middle meatus of the nose was here, right? 
So it is situated on the superior aspect of the medial wall of the maxillary sinus above the first molar site. So in different studies, they have seen that the mean um, distance from this uh, ostium to the most inferior, inferior point of the sinus floor is 28.5 millimeters. Therefore, during the sinus lift, when you don't have enough sinus, uh, you don't have enough bone for the implant, the option is sinus lift. So basically you place bone graft inside of the sinus. You have to consider the position of this ostium and, uh, and we have some variation of patients, right? So, and then it's recommendable that you don't place uh, more than 50% um, of this distance, right? So basically it's not recommendable to place more than 50 millimeter of the bone graft in the, this area to avoid blocking the ostium and causing some type of sinuses, uh, like a sinus infection, permanent sinus infection. They can uh, transfer to the other uh, uh, peronasus uh, space, right? So it has been located to that, um, uh, in 31.7% of the maxillary sinus, we have a presence of the septa, uh, which is another uh, structure that we have to consider uh, when we perform a sinus lift. During a sinus lift, the membrane division over the, this area of the partial septa should proceed laterally to medially. So we go from here to here, instead of uh, anteriorly to posteriorly, uh, because if we go through this orientation, there's a higher chance to cause a membrane perforation. And one of the important things if we want to graft the sinus is to make sure that we have a, an intact uh, schneiderian membrane, which is a sinus membrane, to protect the graft and avoid the, what, the dissemination of the uh, graft into the maxillary sinus. So to accommodate, sometimes we can have a many septas. So in order to, uh, to be able to uh, uh, create the uh, place of bone graft, sometimes we have to open like a mini window, lateral window in order to do it. Um, definitely when you have a septas like this, uh, the vertical sinus lift is not recommended in this case. And then now we'll review a little about the sinus lift. So when we encounter an atrophic ridge, like in this case, with very large maxillary sinus, very low implantation of this sinus, then definitely we, we can perform something called uh, sinus lift or elevation. Basically what we do is we lift the membrane of the sinus and then we cover the area that we gain with the bone graft. So when the sinus lift, uh, when the residual height of the bone is less than five millimeter, then the only option that we have for this sinus lift is to create a lateral approach, right? Uh, a window, lateral window uh, to place the bone graft. But if the residual height of the bone is more than five millimeter, as you can see in this case, which is 5.87 millimeter, then we can opt for a vertical or trans alveolar sinus lift to uh, lift the bone and push the bone inside by pushing the membrane up, as you can see here. And here we have a case of a patient uh, with the 5.87 of the uh, alveolar ridge. And then uh, during the, um, uh, when we perform the, uh, the implant bed, when we do the drilling, then we use uh, this special type of uh, burr uh, that we call densa burr. Um, to create uh, slowly, very with a very low speed, uh, and uh, to and in the in the opposite direction, uh, counterclockwise uh, direction, to try to uh, lift uh, a little of this bone uh, in this area, like a uh, on the on the floor of the sinus, and then we pack with bone and we keep pushing with this bird into the maxillary sinus without damaging the sinus membrane. So in case where we have a small sinus membrane perforation, usually with a red lateral window, uh, in this case, usually we can place uh, 
a collagen uh, membrane to patch that uh, small sinus perforation. But then uh, if you have a, a doing this sinus lift and then you, you have a, a large uh, sinus perforation, in that case, definitely we have to open a little more our window to try to reach the area of the membrane that is intact and try to uh, attain um, uh, to to regain um, re-engage this membrane in the area that is not torn. So here we have the posterior superior alveolar nerve, which is um, a nerve that we can encounter during the sinus lift. Uh, it supplies the sinus, the molars, the buccal gingiva, and the adjoining portion of the cheek. This uh, nerve arises, um, arises uh, within the pterygopalatine fossa and course downward and forward passing through the pterygomaxillary fissure and enters the uh, posterior area of the maxilla. Notice that the location of this area, which is, uh, as you can see here, there here comes the nerve, right? Which is the area um, that is, uh, basically is the area of the, um, of the lateral window. So that uh, this nerve can become injured during the lateral approach of the sinus augmentation. So what happens if the patient decide that they don't want to go through this uh, uh, process of the maxillary sinus, right? Then what other options you have that you can offer the patients? So the alternative could be a guided bone regeneration that would increase a little more the bone thickness of the bone of the alveolar ridge that is in front of the maxillary sinus. So we can place a, a tilted uh, type of implant to create like a kind of all on four or uh, we can offer the patient uh, to use uh, like a short implant and uh, to try to uh, avoid uh, perforating the sinus, uh, the maxillary sinus. Next uh, structure in the, uh, in the maxilla that can uh, affect the implant placement is the nasopalatine foramen. The nasopalatine foramen or incisive, incisive foramen connects uh, the palate to the floor of the nasal cavity. So the canal continues in the oral cavity as a single foramen, as you can see here, but then uh, to the uh, goes inside the nasal cavity, it usually is split in two uh, and, and end up in the foramen of Stenson in the nasal cavity. So through this uh, canal, we have the terminal branch of the descending palatine artery and the nasal palatine nerve. So uh, when we place an implant and we have to think about how we're going to design this uh, flap, then we have to think uh, maybe um, we have to uh, try to create an incision labially or buccally around the, in the nasal palatine foramen the, I mean, the incisive papilla, this is the incisive papilla. And then we want to try to go around it on the buccal position, right? Uh, to try to avoid uh, dissecting the, the nerve, right? But in worst case scenario, uh, we go with the incision and we uh, transect the content of the nasal palatine canal, then um, it's, not, uh, it's not so terrible. Um, but then what can happen is um, the detrimental effect could be uh, paresthesia uh, in this anterior palatal tissue. Or sometimes can cause uh, severe bleeding, right? So, so that's the reason why uh, it's more, uh, it would be better if we can try to go a little buckly to try to not transect the, the content of the nasal palatum foramen. So what happens um, so, uh, when we have a, a large um, nasal palatine canal, uh, the foramen is uh, very big and then it's interfering with our implant placement. And, and remember uh, for the implant, we need to have a two millimeter of the distance between the implant or any canal. So that means that if the uh, uh, nasal palatine foramen is uh, very enlarged, then uh, we have to think the possibility to um, 
displace, sometimes we can displace the content of this nasal palatine uh, to try to place an implant. But if we don't have a two millimeter wall, this couldn't be an option, right? So the other option that has been suggested is to enucleate the content of the nasal palatine foramen of this canal, and then place with bone graft in the area. So pack with the bone graft, and then after that, place the implant. But then that can cause you eventually a little of um, uh, paresthesia in the palate or uh, anterior pal uh, palate of the patient. So the other option is to try to tilt a little the implant uh, within the range that allows you, allow the prostodontist to restore it still, right? So that's very important to have a very good discussion with the prostodontics prior to place the implant. So here, usually what we do, we have a very good collaboration uh, team with the prosthodontic uh, uh, provider, and uh, we always discuss the case prior to uh, the implant placement. The most important concept here is uh, from the prosthetic standpoint. So how, uh, where is the location of the implant in order for them to restore and can give up a good function uh, to those uh, future uh, implant, right? So that's very important to have a very good conversation with the prosthodontic. So in case of the mandibular, uh, in case of the mandible uh, structures can, that can interfere with the dental implants, we have um, one of the important things is the, the morphology of the mandibular arch, right? Uh, so it's very important to uh, understand how is the morphology of the mandible to avoid complications such as uh, profuse bleeding secondary to the drilling of the implant bed. So we have a two situation here. We can cause uh, some type of bleeding uh, because um, uh, we damage severe the um, uh, some type of artery that goes uh, through the mandible, or sometimes uh, we see clinically patients have a very good alveolar reach for the implant, but then we don't see uh, that we have some type of undercut. So then we have uh, some type of depression underneath, and then we go with the implant and we perforate the cortical lingual uh, plate uh, or lingual bone of the mandible and that causes severe bleeding. That's the reason why, again, I recommend you to have a CBCT prior to the implant placement, even if in one implant, sometimes you can have this type of variation that you cannot uh, see during your clinical assessment, and then that can cause you uh, a lot of problem uh, after the uh, implant placement. So in the mandible, the sublingual um, artery and a branch of the lingual artery is the major nutrient vessel in the floor of the mouth. So sometimes uh, we can uh, accidentally drill uh, and when we're drilling for the implant bed and, uh, and then cause some type of damage to this artery. So, and this one, the, the lingual artery uh, is severed, then it can cause a profuse bleeding if we are not uh, uh, identified immediately and, uh, and ligated, right, uh, and controlled because um, uh, the bleeding can be very fast and can cause um, obstruction of the airway by, due to the accumulation of the blood on the floor of the mouth. And that can endanger the patient's life. So that's the reason why it's so important to, to uh, have a very good plan and try to avoid uh, this type of um, uh, complications. Uh, very good planning uh, prior to the surgery. That's the most important part. Uh, one of the things that usually when that happens, uh, what the first thing that you have to do definitely is to make sure to um, uh, compress, right? With the compression, sometimes can help uh, to stop the bleeding. The other thing is that can cause bleeding is during the implant placement uh, when we reflect the flap. On the lingual aspect, uh, appropriate elevation of the flap and visualization is very important, right? To make sure that we don't drill and cause some type of uh, uh, accidental perforation of this lingual flap. So here in this case, uh, we have uh, these um, structures, which is uh, fossa, the submandibular sublingual fossa. Sometimes they are very, uh, they, they have a, they're very shallow and, and um, 
and and sometimes they can close um uh, they can um decrease a little the the thickness of the of the jaw right um and that's the reason why and sometimes we when we palpate clinically we don't know exactly that we have a, a huge undercut in that area due to the presence of these uh salivary glands and uh and then there's a race again to to cause an accidental perforation of the plate if we don't consider uh the the uh Vary, the variation of the anatomy of in that area and and the disease uh, is different in each patient. Um, so, uh, I think I have been mentioned many times about the CBCT and then I will mention again that uh, pre-assessment assessment with the CBCT uh, in this case will be uh, critical because that will allow you to see the presence of um, this huge depression due to the salivary glands and then that uh, will I'll help you to design uh, your implant with a little more angulation to avoid uh, accidental perforation of this area. So the other thing is, uh, besides understanding uh, the basal or the morphology of the mandible, we need to, one of the major uh, the, uh, structure that we have in the mandible and um, definitely can can affect the implant placement is the inferior alveolar nerve canal. So understanding the localization of the nerves in the mandible will help us to avoid complications such as paresthesia. Uh, the mandibular nerves give rise to the inferior alveolar nerve, which we call IAN. Uh, it enters the mandible canal on the medial surface of the ramus um, by the lingula, right? Uh, and then the IN, we have seen that it may present different anatomic configurations. Um, most of the time they are located uh, midway between the back hole and the lingual plates. And, uh, and then we can see that usually uh, it divides into the mental uh, bundle, uh, vascular, neurovascular bundle, and then continue with the incisive nerves to the anterior area, right? Um, so, one thing is um, implant placement uh, buccally or lingually to the eye end is risky maneuver uh, to not be attempted ever uh, without the aid of a CBCT. So you have to make sure that you have some type of distance with the nerve and, uh, and not thinking to place the um, implant having uh, the eye end in this position or in this position. And if you're not sure when you see your X-ray and you're not sure of the position of the AN, uh, always you have to make sure that you have the CVCT and you know so you can uh, find out exactly the exact position of that uh, canal before you plan your implant placement. Remember that uh, we have to have at least the two millimeter uh, of the distance between the implant and the canal. Um, so the other thing is here, the mental nerve, uh, which when you place that implants in the anterior area between the premolars or the first molar, then sometimes you can have uh, this situation of the mental nerve, right? Uh, some patients, they have a, uh, the mental nerve comes with the anterior loop. Some patients, they just have a mental nerve uh, in the normal way that ended uh, without, uh, and, and that usually this one you can see uh, in the panorax, right? But sometimes we can see uh, this anterior loop that can, um, if you don't uh, see it uh, clearly prior to the in, uh, implant, assess, uh, implant pre assessment, then uh, sometimes you can damage this anterior loop and cause uh, bleeding or cause uh, paresthesia of this area uh, that can become uh, permanent sometimes. So, one thing very important is uh, despite the usual CBCT accuracy, there's still some discrepancy between the CBCT and the clinical uh, situation, right? So um, even uh, with the CBCT planning, we still need to make sure when we open this area before the, uh, when we try to drill the in, uh, for the implant bed, we have to make sure that we open the flap, we identify the position of the nerve to make sure that uh, is the position that we were expecting. Um, and then uh, measure exactly before we drill the implant bed. And make sure that you have a two millimeter of the distance between the implant and the uh, canal, the uh, dimension uh, canal foramen, or 
uh, two millimeter uh, in from the loop. So in this case, when we have the loop, it's not two millimeter from the canal; it's two millimeter from the loop. What would be the alternative uh, when you have a this situation? When you have the mental nerve that doesn't allow you to place uh, properly your implant, then uh, the possibility is um, to create a tilted implant that allow you, which we call the all on four, right? To increase the restorative uh, surface, or uh, you can place a short implant. Um, there's uh, some discrepancy with the short implants, right? Because you can see that usually we'll, uh, we expect that the length of the implant uh, is proportional to the uh, length of the crown. So we don't create a lot, uh, too much load on the implant. Uh, but some study have shown like a longitudinal uh, 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 assessment of the implant. And then they are seen that uh, these short implants, they are able to support the loading. Uh, the masticatory loading, but then other study have shown uh, lots of failure of these short implants. So, and the other possibility is uh, to transpose the uh, infraalveolar nerve, so you don't have another option, and then this nerve is in the lingual palatal, I mean, in the lingual buccal, right? So what you can do is you can create a, a window in this area, and then uh, we place, uh, we uh, retract the nerve, we place the implant, and then uh, we place some type of uh, barrier here between the implant and the nerve, so the nerve is in not in direct contact with the implant, and then we close um, uh, the flap. Yes, and uh, so that would be the options um, in case you have this um, nerve that doesn't allow you to place the implant. So in conclusion, I can say that um, uh, it's important uh, to, consi to uh, consider uh, a very good um, assessment uh, prior to the implant uh, placement, right? So we have to make sure that we have a very comprehensive knowledge of the anatomy. Uh, we have to perform a very thorough implant pre-assessment uh, from the clinical and the radiographic uh, standpoints. Um, this is our complementary. We cannot uh, do just the clinical or in, in a simple type of a conventional radiograph. We have to make sure that uh, we have all the information that we need to place the implant. And uh, always consider the possibility to include the CBCT imaging in your implant planning. And keep in mind that one of the basic concepts of the implant placement for the success is to maintain uh, bone around the implant. And, Ideally, it has to be around two millimeter or bone around. Um, otherwise, uh, with the time, uh, if you don't have enough bone, the remaining bone is going to resolve and it's going to cause the failure of the implant. And we can see that sometimes you place the implant, even you measure the stability, and then it seems like uh, in that moment it's pretty good. But then sometimes the initial uh, stability is due to the mechanical retention uh, of the bone uh, and the implant, right? But then eventually we know that during the healing process, uh, we have uh, some type of uh, bone resorption process. Uh, and then that if you don't have enough bone in that area, uh, like a 0 0.5 millimeter or one millimeter even, uh, that bone usually tend to resolve. And then patient is going to come back a few months later with uh, mobility or infection of the implant. And uh, most of the case, the reason is because of that. There's not enough bone around uh, the implant. and during the healing process with the resorption um, cause um, in more inflammatory reaction and then infection of the infant site. Thank you very much uh, for your attention um, and I'm open to questions. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Song, for that uh, very valuable, I mean, I mean, I, I have to myself go back to these lectures. <laughs> this becomes uh, a, a way to, I mean, there's so many things that you, you take for granted when you're, you're trying to place this. Sometimes, you know, I was asking myself, maybe there's some cases I just need to refer, refer the placement to somebody else, let them deal with all this headache, you know. <laughs> anyway, but there's a question here by uh, Shedrach Ifyong. Uh, I like uh, then most of the most of the participants on, on this uh, webinar today are from Nigeria. Uh, you have uh, someone from Tanzania 
uh, and maybe another person from uh, from Uganda, but mostly they are doctors and dental students. A couple of dental students, but mostly mostly practitioners from Nigeria. So, you guys, if you have any questions, please, if you want to raise your hand, I want to ask you a question directly. Please do so. Um, uh, the question by Ifyong Shedrak, he says, uh, what, what can cause an excessively enlarged nasopalatin fossa? Oh, actually, the, it's, um, uh, the truth is, is uh, uh, depending on patient, right? There's no, uh, it's no uh, different patients, some patient, it, uh, related to the patient. There's no um, uh, a reason why some patients have an enlarged nasopalatin or not. It's uh, just uh, basically a genetic condition probably of the patient that some of them has a enlarged nasopalatin. Unless the patient have uh, some type of cyst, of the nasopalatin canal, um, and then in that case, they will have an enlarged uh, nasopalatin foramen, right? Yes, okay. Uh, also, there's a, a question here uh, by, uh, you say, based on the classification of bone quality, what anatomic quality enables the uh, stability for zygomatic implants? Uh, uh, did you mention anything? Okay, the zygomatic implant, I didn't mention the zygomatic implant. Actually, that's one of the uh, very good uh, questions um that um because the zygomatic implant um usually we leave that as a last resource uh because it comes up with some type of uh, uh uh can cause some type of issues uh eventually on the, uh with the time right and usually uh the zygomatic implant we use that in patient with cancer uh, uh resections and need to have a and then reconstruction and then uh we we place the zygomatic implant so, um, and then all in patients, in case of patients that uh, the you, very atrophic alveolar ridge, you try to use a, to place bone graft and nothing is working. And then in that case, uh, maybe the last option for them is zygomatic implant. One thing very important is zygomatic, uh, the zygoma, the bone, the zygoma actually is very cancerous, it's trabecular. Uh, it's not very good, it's pretty soft. But the stability given for the zygomatic implant uh, is based on the two or three cortical bones that have to pass in order to get to the zygoma. And that is the, uh, uh, the bone that gives the stability to the zygomatic implant. So it's not basically the zygoma bone that's create the stability of the zygomatic implant. It's the uh, layer of the bone, cortical bone that uh, have to go through these zygoma like, implant that make them stable. Okay. So usually it's two or three, uh, like a three or four layers, right? Okay. Uh, another question here is like, it's like uh, it says CBCT is often uh, not usually available in re research uh, as challenge practices, especially where where uh, most of us are in West Africa. Uh, what 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 can we do to achieve acceptable implant placement using? Um, the the OPG the C, the pan radiograph and the periapical that's what most people have access to. Uh, so what what can you do? Uh, so it's a number of common the possibility is to have a like a, a CT scan. Yes, it's not very common. It's not very common. Yeah, um, I think uh, definitely in this case, uh, usually um, uh, one of the 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 thing that we use like a PA for example, which is uh, not uncommon to use the periapical uh, radiograph, and uh, that will give us a little more um, uh, less distortion in comparison to the panels. But then I would say that uh, sometimes um, you need to have both of them uh, to give you a better idea uh, about the different localization of the nerve uh, or of the sinus, and then. Um, so you combine both, right? The panoramic to give you an overview and the periapical image to give you a little more accurate position uh, of your bone and, and, the, and the length and the width and the length, basically. The width, basically, you have to uh, handle this uh, clinically by measuring this clinically. Okay. Another question here is like uh, two millimeters around the implants is not, uh, it's not, it's not usually, uh, you know, achievable in in the anterior so they say so what, what what can you do yeah i have to say that um uh i will recommend you to do the bone graft um because uh, the anterior area one important thing is um uh the aesthetic right it's a very important the uh, uh, anterior area so you don't have exposure of the middle uh, in the future right 
So, um, and then if you don't have enough bone, eventually that um, you, you're going to, the, the metal part is going to be translucent, right? Because the bone, the, the thickness of the gingiva is related to the thickness of your bone. So uh, for us, uh, when we place the anterior uh, implant, um, we always make sure that we have uh, uh, enough bone to create that two millimeter of the buccal bone to avoid a uh, future uh, problem from the cosmetic standpoint. So what we do is we place bone graft prior to the implant placement. Okay, okay. All right. Uh, if you let me see if there's any more questions here. There's one more, I think. Um, so you said in, in terms of uh, determining the bone quality, uh, obviously we, we can tell from the anatomy um, what you know what an estimated quality would be if it's maxilla or mandible. So how do you is there is there a clinical way or for assessing? I know the the, the CBCT gives you some. House field I mean, units that. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> one, one thing very important is, it's true. Um, I, I have been telling you all the time about the CDCT, right? Which is a very good um, uh, aid for you for the diagnosis from standpoint, from the planning standpoint. But one thing very important still is uh, the clinical assessment. So um, in the CBCT is not going to allow you to see clearly uh, uh, clearly how is the quality of the bone and the only way that you you find out basically is the moment when you start drilling then you will see that uh what's the quality right um when you start drilling it's the moment that you see it's a very dense bone that allows it barely you can drill very well to create the implant bed or sometimes you just drill and then goes uh immediately down very fast right uh, so that's the reason why um, I think a clinically uh, decision is one of the important parts here. Okay. Uh, there's one last question here about uh, resorption with short implants. Uh, obviously, do uh, you want to say, you want to speak to that? The, the short implants? Yes. I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, like a controversy about the short implants, right? Because some people say that the short implants, they're very good, but... Um, the the truth is I don't work with short implant. I can't tell you uh, uh, if it, they're good or not, right? But then w based on the studies, uh, there's a lot of studies that show a lot of a failure of the short implant. And then uh, I have to say that I have had a lot of patients who had a uh, short implant before that failed, and then they came back, they come here to us to look for another solution for uh, the treatment. So uh, I have a few cases that what we do is uh, we bone graft the area and then um, and then we place the um, an implant of the like a 10 millimeter uh, or 11.5 millimeter. Okay. All right. I, I'm going to allow a couple of people. Uh, Dr. Arnold Mahiga uh, from Tanzania. Are, are you there? Hello? Yes, go ahead. Um, from the point of sinus lift, um, Dr. Song explained that the lateral window approach has more chance uh, to damage the posterior superior velar nerve and uh, the blood vessels. So my concern is from her experiences, what can she say about the vertical approach? What, what's her advice concerning the vertical approach? And question number two is, in the case of mandible, we have the inferior velar nerve there's one alternative she mentioned of having the implant. Um, um, if you can't create a gap of two millimeters from the inferior velar nerve and the implant, there's an alternative of having an implant either away and create a barrier between an implant and the nerve. And so I'm, I'm wondering, like, we still have to have a, a thickness of 1.5 to 2 millimeters of the back bone, or we What's the matter there? You, you do get a question. No. So, so we have a, um, uh, thank you, Dr. Mahiga, for the question. But um, you, you have a two questions, right? The first question is about the uh, posterior superior alveolar nerve doing the lateral approach, right? Yes. And, and, and the question uh, is, um, I mean, we don't have that problem if we do the vertical approach. 
and I, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't understand very well the, the question. Yeah, yeah, he wanted to know more about the vertical approach. But so you said that that problem doesn't exist when you do a vertical approach. Yeah, the vertical approach basically is a transfer alveolar approach, right? You just go inside of the uh, of the bone. I mean, you you basically drill the income bed. So usually uh, you don't have that um, nerve because the nerve is a little higher position, right? And and it's not so much. Uh, uh, in the uh, when when you drill uh, through the implant bed, because uh, the in case of lateral approach, you have to make a window, which is in the area where the uh, the nerve is passing, right? Sometimes. Okay. Okay. Is is that the question? Sure. Dr. Mahiga. Hello. Yes, I, I think you answered the first one. It, it, all right, and the second one, uh, the question is related to um, the the distance to the nerve. Yes, and he was saying that if you if you if you are, if um if a way to do it is to compromise on the on the buccal, you know, in terms of move it a little bit buccally, uh, to uh, so you don't get that two point uh, two one point five to two millimeters of buccal bone, but at least you raise it up. Or I'm imagining just using a bigger size implant that is shorter, right? Oh, yeah. and, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Anirabi, can, can you uh, say that again, uh, repeat the question? No, I, 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 Dr. Mahir, correct me if, if uh, I know you were talking about if you, if you are not able to get uh, that two millimeters away from the nerve, then what alternative do you have? This is what it was what he was asking. Oh, okay. So basically, um, uh, when we mentioned, right, the, uh, when you're not able to have that, wh what happens is some, usually you use like a, uh, like a 10 millimeter of uh, implant in the area. And then even with the 10 millimeter implant, you don't have that distance to the nerve. Uh, usually what we do, we try to graft a little the, the cervical area of the implant to try to gain uh, the millimeter that we, we don't have. Okay, okay. 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 So put some bone over it. So at least that raises the height vertical. That, that that that's a good one. Yeah. Doctor Mahiga, are you clear clear on that? Yeah. Sure. But my concern is there's one of them that you Doctor mentioned of having an implant a bit away. That's not in terms of vertical, but the horizontal having an implant is a more buckle to escape the inferior lower nerve and then you create a barrier between the nerve and the implant. So my concern is, do we still consider having a bone thickness of 1.5 to 2 millimeter or there's another considerations? Yeah. I, 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 Dr. Song, do you understand, did you get this question? No, I'm sorry. Well, he's uh, saying that when we have to move buccally just to be able to avoid the nerve, um, and you reduce the you amount. You mean buccally of, to transpose the nerve? No, no. I mean, once you move the implant both, I mean, more facially or buccally to, in terms of the direction, I mean, he was asking, are you more, are you concerned that you will lose? But I, I'm, I'm thinking what you said about adding bone. If you graft it a little bit more, then you should be able to have. Yeah, some usually if uh, if you have to move a little your your implant and then and then uh, because the nerve structure, then you see that. Uh, and usually you want to do a little more expense of the buccal plate, right? You, you want to keep the the palatal plate uh, uh, with the the um, uh, the amount of bone that you need because you know that uh, if you sacrifice of a little buccal plate, then you still can uh, place the bone graft, right? To try to compensate the bone that you don't have. Yes, I I, I believe that that answers. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Mahiga, uh, for, for yeah, that. Thank you very much for your good question. Thank you very much. Um, one last question before we let you go. He said, uh, apart from commercially available most substitutes, are there other intraoral sources? I guess you, you already know the answer to this question, but uh, he's asking. Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator 